All right, here we go. It's showtime. Hey, Mr. Palm Balls, tell me how. Hey, Mr. Palm Balls, let's do it now. Hey, Mr. Palm Balls, you're the one that makes fishing so much fun. Yeah, well, so I much fun. Palm Balls. And I headed for my pond. Meet Mr. Palm Balls, yeah, we're gonna chase the sun. Hello everybody, Bob and Lusk, the Pond Boss checking in from North Texas where it's kind of balmy. Look at there, John Funk's already on, he's from uh, mid-Michigan. So uh, we're going to get things rolling here pretty quick. We've got a lot of questions to go through and hopefully we'll have one or two answers. So uh, let's get at it. First of all, you guys know the drill. I see Fred Bingham and Tory Road. Good gosh, there's a bunch of guys on so far. The uh, What I want you to do, click like. Share this video to your timeline, please, so we can build an audience. And in the comment section, put hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. If you'll do that, you're eligible for a Pond Boss hat. One size fits almost everybody except Ken Milam, my good friend with a big head. I love you, Ken Milam. And you also get a Pond Boss mug right there. So here we go. We're going to rock and roll. We've got a bunch of questions tonight. What I thought we'd talk about is bass behavior. I've had a bunch of people ask me. I did, I did a uh, Facebook Live video on Keep Austin Fishing Weekly Weigh-In yesterday. And my gosh, I was stunned at the number of questions about uh, the way bass behave during these transitional times from hot summer temperatures to cooler fall temperatures. So we're going to talk about that. But you know, I love to stay uh, uh, in tune with current events and... There's a giant hurricane bearing down on the eastern coast of the United States. Now, Jason Nipstad is one of our regulars. If he's watching this, I'll be surprised because he should evacuate. Uh, and I, but I want to talk about the uh, impact of extreme weather. I want to spend some time talking about that tonight. Extreme weather meaning hurricanes, floods, and droughts. I mean, you go you go west and. I mean, West Texas, um, California, uh, part of the Rocky Mountains, they're in, a, they're in a serious, severe drought. So I want to talk about droughts, I want to talk about floods, and the main thing I want to talk about first is uh, the way bass behave when we're going from warmer months to cooler months. First of all, I want to answer a few questions, so bear with me here. I'm going to see if I can get the live video feed up on my laptop so I can see the questions in real time. I broadcast from a phone, go figure, an iPhone, actually I do. And so now what I want to do is see if I can make sure that the, that the live feed is up, which yep, there it is. So that way I want to be able to get it and blow it up so I can see the questions as they're coming on. Okay, good gosh, a lot of guys. Mike Cottrell, my buddy told me that he wanted your opinion. Holy cow, I'll give an opinion. I always have an opinion, whether I'm right or wrong. It doesn't matter. Let's see, Leanne Skipworth, Dick Tabert, and says two other people. Heck, I don't know. Frank James, hi Frank. Tom Davis, Todd Austin. Good gosh, I have, we're, we're, this little show's kind of gaining some traction, getting a following. Well, you know what? Let me see if I can hit the question first. Bobby Bolton sent me a really interesting question through a uh, Facebook uh, message. I'm gonna read it to you. It says, hey Bob, I have a 20 acre lake that I stocked with tiger bass six years ago. The bass are very healthy and they've grown really well. I have issues, I had issues with grass in the early years and I stocked grass carpet 10 per acre as recommended. Well, now I have no grass and they're actually doing damage to my shoreline. I need help trying to get the carp out. I tried a gill net in February when the water was cold and I caught 25 bass from five and a half to nine pounds, ouch. I should have asked Bobby if those uh, bass made it because when they're in a gill net, that's pretty harsh. We tried bow hunting or bow fishing at night with no success. Any recommendations you may have would be greatly appreciated. I really need to get these carp out of my lake and I would like to reestablish some grass growth. Well, you know, it's kind of like Here's the answer that I'm going to give you. When you take a cucumber and you put it in vinegar, it's a pickle. It can't be a cucumber anymore. 
Grass carp live 12 to 14 years, maybe even 15 or 16 years. Uh, Bobby is from Bell Platte, Louisiana. And so grass carp lifespans will probably be a little shorter there because they have a lot of warm months. And they have a lot of vegetation. So I'm going to come at you from a couple of different angles on this answer. First of all, he stocked them too heavy. He put 10 per acre. Well, it didn't, you know, that grass, that vegetation did not uh, grow all in one year. It took it several years to get to the point where it was consuming a significant amount of that pond or that lake, that 20 acre lake. So what I tell people is this, start off with low numbers, three or four per acre. And if the vegetation is out of hand, then treat some of it with herbicides and knock it out with some approved herbicides. Now he didn't tell me what kind of grass, and really for this conversation it's irrelevant, but the kind of vegetation you have determines the best treatment plan or the best protocol to use to manage it. Now I love vegetation in ponds and lakes, especially in bass lakes, because that's where bait fish can hide and live long enough that they can become a significant little morsel. Speaking of Bobby Bolton, he just checked in. Hey Bobby, I'm tackling your question. So uh, the, I think the problem is that you started off with too many grass carp in the beginning and now you're playing from behind. Well, since I answered your question in the writing, I've thought about it a little bit. One thing I would do is I would add some artificial habitat, you know, some mossback fish attractors. That's a good idea. PVC pipe, brush piles. If you have some habitat or some structure or some cover that you can add to replace the vegetation, that will help your fishery. But the question you asked me is how do, I, how do I get rid of the grass carp? Not an easy answer. That's why I tell people to stock three or four per acre. And if you need more, stock more. But I think a, a, a multifaceted way um, protocol to manage those plants is a smarter thing. Don't just look for grass carp as the only answer. Uh, how do you get rid of them? You don't. Now, what you can do is you can start a feeding program. You just, you, for, for, for this purpose, feed the cheapest floating fish food you can find. The grass carp will come to it, and then you pick them off one at a time. Now, in a 20-acre lake at 10 to the acre, that's 200. But if you can shoot 50 or 75 of them over a one-year period, you've impacted the lake. You've made a difference. So I think that's, that's the angle I would go from there. Um, now, of course, I'm sitting here behind a computer giving you advice. Uh, there's just really not an easy answer to get rid of grass carp once you have them. You can't electrofish them. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've launched our electrofishing boat, and I've been at the helm thousands of time, times, you have to hit a grass carp dead perfect on its body to freeze it, to be able to catch it and take it out. If it is, if it feels the tingle of the electricity as you're coming on it, it's going to escape. It's going to make a surge and it's going to fly and it's, gonna, it's gone. You're not going to get it. So electrofishing isn't efficient. The gill nets are a good idea in theory, but the problem is, is you're going to catch your good fish too. You know, so that's not a good answer either. Either Victor Moberg asked a question. He said um, he's looking at he's looking at doing some dirt moving. He says, "Good afternoon, Bob. I want to see what you would estimate the average cost per yard removed on a pond is dirt. Just a rough number." Well, I'm going to tell you, I have seen bids lately. Most of them hover around two dollars per cubic yard, up to three dollars plus per cubic yard of dirt moved. Well. And that, that's, it's really based on how far you have to move the dirt and what kind of dirt you got to deal with. If you got dirt that's easy to move, you're not moving it far, costs less. I've even seen one bid recently at $1.50 a cubic yard, which don't expect to see that with the price of diesel the way it is right now. So his uh, follow-up question was, so when you figure the average depth to determine the amount of soil that will be needed to be excavated, does the existing grade deduct from the yardage amount. In other words, if there's a creek, a gully, or a swale, does that deduct from the cost of the dirt? No, it doesn't. Because in order to build a dam, you have to excavate all the unnecessary soil or the soil that's not good to have in a dam to build a foundation below ground level. Then you gotta go get the right kind of dirt, clay, basically, to come back in uh, build the core trench and then build a dam and then you got to move dirt inside the pond to build the habitat So it's not a fair statement to say yeah We can cut a few corners or it won't cost as much to move dirt because there's a creek It's irrelevant 
All right, so let me see here. We've got a lot of things going good. Gosh, where'd all these people come from? I love it. This is great. We got, uh, let me see here. Holy cow, Eric Avery, Jennifer Royce. Hey, our taxidermist, Brendan's checking in. Jim Liner, a good gun and a treble hook removed the grass carp. You know, that is one other thing to talk about with grass carp is, is you can make a, if, here's an idea. I've used this. It works pretty good. You just got to be patient. If you can get them on fish food, then you can take that fish food and you can moisten it, add a um, add some cornstarch or something to make it hold together, and put it on a make a little ball and put it on a little bitty treble hook, and you can catch grass carp that way. The problem with that is that you're also going to have other fish that are feeding on that feed, specifically catfish or bluegills or whatever's coming to that feed. But if it's dock Predominantly grass carp, you can bait them in and catch them sometimes. Now, you know, the good news is you have 200 of them in a 20 acre lake, and if you can get rid of 50 or 100, then that makes a big difference. Holy cow, Jennifer Royce, Eric Avery, um, Joseph Reynolds, Jason Nepstead. Hey, just talking about you, man. We're going to talk about your deal here in a minute. John Mikulik. Jennifer Royce, hello from West Virginia. Bobby Bolton, I have a lot of timber in my lake. Well, that kind of mitigates the uh, need to have more habitat. Now, the problem with timber in a lake, Bobby, is that fish don't live above the water line. <laughs> we knew that. So, if you could, when, if the lake drops a little bit, go in and cut some of those trees or half cut them, let them fall over in the water, and you've got more fish structure. Totally off course here. Scott Lindsay, good evening, Bob. Hi, Scott. Kevin Briggs checking in. Hey, Kevin. Troy Todd, did you figure out what caused your fish kill? You know what? I'm getting close to it. Let me tell you about that. I, I posted a little video. I don't know. I, I was getting ready to go to uh, St. Louis, and I had some fish in a hatchery pond. This is kind of interesting. You guys will like this. You can go back to my, I think I put it on my Bob Lusk Facebook page, or maybe Pond Boss. I don't remember. One of them, I put uh, a video. We have behind our office right here where I'm sitting, we've got six small hatchery ponds. They got really cool names. Pond 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Well, Pond 1, 2, and 3 have bluegills in them now. Well, Pond number 2, I saw some fish popping at the surface at daylight on, uh, I guess it was Saturday a week ago. Well, what I thought was, and the water was a little turbid, due more to uh, suspended clay particles than anything else. Now, here, here, here's the deal. It's about four-tenths of an acre. It's about five feet deep. Fresh well water in the pond, stocked with 5,000 bluegill that weighed 32 pounds in May. So, it's fresh, clean water, not very many fish per unit of water. You know, 30, at, at the time this event occurred, there might be 60 pounds of bluegill in that pond. And that's nothing. That's not much at all. Well, I noticed the fish were up piping for air. So I thought, oh my gosh, we've got enough plankton bloom, enough algae or whatever growing in here that we're having a little bit of an oxygen depletion. Well, I came back the next afternoon. I actually, I left on Sunday morning to go to St. Louis. So I came back on Sunday afternoon and they were still piping. That's not normal because when you have an oxygen depletion due to photosynthesis compared to respiration, then what you expect to happen is when the sun comes up, and does what the sun does to create photosynthesis with the with the plants, the oxygen levels rise. Well, fish were still piping at the surface on Saturday afternoon. So I came back on Sunday morning and oh my gosh, there were little dead bluegills everywhere. So Justin Stain that works for me, one of the fisheries biologists, I had him collect a sample of water and send it off to Bill Cody and the algae counts and cyanobacteria counts were high, really high. So uh, I had Justin send a sample off to see what the water chemistry is and see if the water chemistry has changed. What my fear was that we might have some golden algae, but we don't. I mean, these ponds are above natural ground level. They get a tiny bit of runoff off the roof of this building behind me and a tiny bit of runoff off of a lawn. There's no runoff coming in. It's only well water. So I'm going to tell you 95% of the water in that pond comes from a well. So what we're zeroing in on, it's probably due to some toxins 
from a plankton bloom that was some kind of algae or a cyanobacteria, a blue-green algae, that's the, that's the culprit. I don't know that yet, but that's what I'm thinking. I'm glad you asked that. I will share that with you when I figure it out. You know, there's nothing logical about that fish kill, but we're going to figure it out because I don't want it happening again. I mean, the pond boss killing fish? What? No, that doesn't happen. Uh, yes, it does. If you mess with fish, fish die at some point. And I can tell you story after story of ways I've killed fish, but that's not one that I expected. Scott Lindsay, greetings. Let's see here. I want to go back down to the bottom here. Holy cow, John Henry, Dick Tavern. How's the teeth? <laughs> well, what Dick's talking about is I went to see my good friend Bruce Condello in Nebraska. I broke a tooth when I was in uh, St. Louis last week getting ready to give a speech. I thought he was going to have to pull it. Well, I mean, how many people do you know that will drive from Texas to, you know, eight and a half hours to Lincoln, Nebraska to see the dentist? Well, man, I've been dying to see Bruce anyway. He and I are great friends. He grows huge fish. If you'll uh, spend a little time on the Palm Boss Facebook page, and maybe I'll put, you know, I probably, y'all tell me, you guys watch this, I don't. I think I put it on the Bob Lusk Facebook page, but Bruce fixed my teeth. Hey, I had no cavities. Remember to floss, but the advice my dentist gives me is floss the ones you want to keep. That's very important. <laughs> so, the teeth are fine, and I feel pretty good about it. I had zero cavities, but I needed a crown, and I needed to get the cracked tooth fixed, and he fixed it. There's a lot of cool things going on there, but here's the better news. I caught some 11-inch sunfish. We sat there on his dock on the rock quarry, south of Lincoln, Nebraska, and we caught fish after fish after fish as we were drinking ounce after ounce of wine. He had a great wine. He and I split a bottle. It was really fun. And those we, had, we caught red ear sunfish. He's got some beastly red ear sunfish, and he's got some giant bluegills and some giant hybrid sunfish. And Bruce has big bluegill web, uh, bigbluegill.com website and the big bluegill page on Facebook. Check him out. And we, we, just, we just got to catch up. It was really fun. But thanks for caring about my teeth. All right, so uh, let's see here. Tory Rhodes. Holy cow, Mark Gaffney. Huh? Let's see. John Funk. So, nice and sunny here. No hurricanes. I got that. Vince Beard checking in from Nacogdoches. Hi, Vince. Good to see you, buddy. Let's see. Uh, Bill Russell from Lower A, L.A., Lower Alabama. I want to circle back on Mike Cottrell's question here. He says, pour the Milo corn and millet to it about November. You'll thank me later. Pour the Milo corn and millet to what? You know, if you're using Milo corn and millet, really the only reason to use that is if you want to chum some fish in so that you can catch them. There's really no fish that I know of that we care about that make a living eating those grains. Now, I'll tell you this. Carp, um, buffalo to a lesser extent, species of catfish. They'll eat grains like that and do okay, but when you feed grains, grains, bluegill, bass, hybrid stripers, none of the game fish will eat that stuff. So, um, you know, Mike, throw me a little bit more, a, a little bit different question there. Kind of pin it down for me and I'll zero in on John Henry, hello boss. Hi, John. Hi, John. Okay, so let me scroll down here. Frank James, good to see you. Hey, yeah, okay. Uh, Jim Liner, thanks for putting our photos twice in the current issue. Jim and Andy, yeah, I did. Well, dude, you guys raised some beastly bass. You guys raised some huge bass. I can't even get my hands wide enough to get them in this screenplay here. You guys do grow some huge fish. You know, Jim Liner is a biologist that lives in Montgomery, Alabama, helps Ray Scott. Ray didn't. Uh, Ray recently sold his property that he that he's been on forever since the '80s to an outstanding landowner and steward from Montgomery, and they have some giant largemouth bass. As a matter of fact, I think Phil and Stream called Ray Scott's Lake the top one of the top five best private bass fishing lakes in the United States. And I'm going to tell you, yeah, it is. It's great, and it's doing no small part to what Jim Liner does on a daily basis. Jim Liner, you're a hero, dude. I love it. You're uh, you got this going on. Let me see. I'm gonna scroll down a little more of this stuff here. 
see what we got. Christopher Aguilar, Mike Augustine. Hey, Mike, I hope you hooked up with Otto and you've made a decision. Mike uh, Augustine is thinking about buying some property. And let's talk about that for a minute because I think it's really smart. Before he bought the property, he wanted to do some due diligence to see if there was a place to build a lake. So Mike Otto met up with him over there and looked at it, and they started looking at places they could build a pond, and it's kind of in an area that is on the cusp of low rainfall compared to high rainfall. So they had to study the size of the watershed, and I think they came to a completion, or conclusion that, it, that it, you could build a pretty good pond there. Doug Briggs says, hello. Okay, Eric Avery, your topic is natural factors on ponds. What about flooding heavy rain in our ponds? Will proper aeration settle those new clay particles faster than a pond without aeration? All right, Mike, I'll come. Hey, Eric, I'll come back to you. Hey, Justin Shank, the sun's still up in your part of the country. I'm looking out the window. It's going down here before long. Mike Cottrell, okay, here's the question of what my buddy told me. Told me Pour the Milo corn and millet to it about, to what? What are you going to pour it to? You're going to, I mean, we can make some whiskey out of Milo corn and millet, or maybe we can make a chum. I don't know what you want to pour pour it to. What are we pouring that green stuff to? Are we going to put it in a uh, bucket and ferment it and chum some fish in so we can catch them? Are we feeding something? you got to zero in on that a little bit more. Hey, Nate Herman, good to see you, buddy. Let's see, Jim Keith, ever seen sulfur in groundwater? Tory Rose, looks like you have, looks like he gave you a little extra laughing gas. Yeah, he did. And I liked it. Don't you, Tory Rose? Do you like laughing gas? Okay, so I'm going to go back to Eric Avery. Your topic is natural factors on ponds. What about flooding heavy rain in our ponds? Will proper aeration settle those new clay particles faster than a pond without aeration? Uh, no. Now, it depends on how the aeration is going. If you've got it where your um, diffusers are sitting off the bottom a little bit, I'm going to tell you that the more the water moves, the less likely the clay is to settle. Now, that doesn't mean it won't because I've seen it do that over and over and over. But the more you move the water, the more you tend to keep the clay in suspension, the less likely it is to settle fast. Uh, since we do have a topic, I'm gonna to hit you with it. Large mouth bass behavior. Let's, let me talk about that for a minute. I'm gonna scroll down here and see what else. Um, Tory Rhodes, yeah, I got you. Okay, yeah, laughing gas, I'm giggling. Ever seen sulfur and groundwater cause problems? I really haven't, because what happens with sulfur and groundwater, I've got wells that are just loaded with sulfur, but when the water hits the air, some of that sulfur turns into a gas, and you can smell it. It smells like rotten eggs leaving. So it has a tendency to either precipitate into the pond bottom, or it has a tendency to form a gas like hydrogen sulfide, which is toxic, but I have yet to see groundwater where the sulfur is is toxic. It has a tendency to leave. Let's see, Mike Haley, I'm fascinated by your show even though I don't own a pond, but I do hope to own one one day. I love that. Look at there, Nate Herman's checking in. He's got the deal. Hey, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Share, the, share this uh, program, share it on your timeline. Click like. And you're going to be eligible for a cap. You're going to be able to win a cap and a Pond Boss mug. Now, last week I was in St. Louis. I didn't get to announce our winner last week, but week before last it was Brad Rom. Hey, Brad, we need your address. Send it to info at pondboss.com. Last week was Justin Hansard. We got Justin's email address or his mailing address. Justin is a county agent in Montague County, Texas. Very active in pond management stuff over there. Matt Rail checking in. Hello, Matt. I'm getting a little behind here, but I'm going to catch up, I promise. Yeah, Jim Liner's kind of bragging a little bit. Hey, dude, I don't blame you. Um, let's see. Excuse me, brother. Outdoor Life ranked us as the number one bass lake in the USA. That's because they fished in two. But, hey, credit where credit's due. You got it. Let's see, Mike Cottrell, he was telling me to put it in the pond in November. I told him to ask the pond boss. Okay, all right, you know what? I'm not getting a good answer to your question. I'm not getting a good answer to my question. Hey, Mike, don't put any grain in the pond. It will ferment, it will rot, nothing will eat it, and it will cause problems with your water. So there's your answer. Zach Russell, tuning in from Fayetteville, North Carolina. Ouch. Um, boy, you guys are in the crosshairs of that hurricane. I hope it works out. Man, holy cow, that's going to be a big deal. 
Taking a break from hurricane prep. Don't take a break, man. Get ready. That's a bad hurricane coming at you guys. Let's see. Nate Herman, we just finished up the Marathon Man event. Now we headed to bed, but I wanted to check in with you guys. Nice smile tonight. Yeah. Teeth. My teeth have been clean. Good to see you there, Nate. Okay. Uh, Brandon, any advice for targeting largemouth bass in the northeast as the winter transitions back and forth from summer to fall? Okay. Um, sure. Dick Tavert, been going around the pond and there's bass everywhere. Probably 75 or 112 inches and under, been thinning them out. Zach McKenzie, how much structure is needed for growing large bass? Mike Cottrell, one more, hey Mike, you and I are having a conversation, was telling me it will help my pond out in winter because it's Oklahoma thing. Sorry for the crazy questions. Didn't see. Okay. Okay. Let me make it real simple. Do not put any grain in your pond. It does nothing for the winter. It does nothing for the pond. All it is is a chum for fish, and they don't need it. There's your answer. So I'm going to pitch the question about the uh, grain. So I'm going to shift gears and talk about bass behavior in transition. <clears throat> you guys know that in the springtime, the bass come up and spawn, and as the water gets warm, the pond stratifies. So you end up with a warm layer of water sitting on top of a cooler layer of water. The cooler layer of water runs out of oxygen pretty fast. The warm layer of water is where all the healthy things going on in the pond occur. So as we make it through the summer, bass go into their summer patterns where they go deep. As they go deep, their main motion, their main uh, mission is to, is to be able to eat when they want to eat, find a cooler temperature, and be able to breathe. That's pretty much it. So what goes on in the summertime with bass patterns is they'll feed for maybe 30 seconds to two minutes per day. Now that's it. They don't feed a lot. And if you, if you think about this, for you guys like Chris Dobbs, I see Chris checking in. If, if when you see a bass eat, it moves, it sees what's going on up and then bam, it strikes and it's done. It swallows whatever it's gonna eat. Big bass have big habits. Now listen to this. Big bass have big habits. A five or six pound bass would much rather eat a 10 or 12 inch bass than it would eat little bitty bluegills. It wants to have a big meal. So because of that, they, they don't move real fast. They tend to be, they'd rather be ambush predators where the lion wait and when their meal comes by, they'll go eat it and then they'll come right back where they are. So let's just be optimistic and say that a bass feeds three times a day. Maybe it takes two minutes to do that. That leaves 23 hours and 57 minutes that it isn't eating. What does it do then? It rests. Hey, Sydney, good to see you. Hi, Dusty Allen checking in. Good to see you. So when that bass rests, it migrates down into deeper water and its tendency is to sit in the thermocline where it's a little bit cooler. That's when they get complacent. So, you know, when you're fishing for those fish, first of all, you gotta find them. So if your pond has some structure that, that goes through the thermocline, where a bass has a chance to move vertically up and down in your structure or your cover near the thermocline, odds are that's where it's gonna be. Now, how do you make it bite? Well, that's part of what fishing is all about. You know, when I was doing the Keep Austin Fishing Weekly Weigh-In show yesterday, one comment that gained some traction, I told people, you know, largemouth bass live on their instincts and their conditioning. They get used to what's going on in your pond or your lake. So anytime they have a positive reinforcement like Pavlov's dog, you know, when you teach your dog to sit, you give them a treat, sit, treat, sit, treat. Well, when your bass can figure out that there's a school of shad coming by, and they can go eat in that and they come right back where they were, or that there's bluegill hanging around that beaver lodge and they can go migrate toward the beaver lodge, eat, and then go back to that, to that point right next to that log, next to that drop off in shallow water, close to deeper water at the thermocline, that's what they're gonna do. So if you can figure those behavior patterns out, then you're gonna be more likely to catch a fish. But my catch phrase was, Bass operate on instinct and conditioning. That's it. They can't think. They don't have the ability to, to rationale, rationalize things. They can't figure out what's going on. 
They can't look over there and say, whoa, there's a big bluegill. I think I'm going to go eat at that. Or, hold it, there's a school of shiners. I can get more out of that. They can't think. They can't figure out how to decide. They can't make decisions. So with that instinct and conditioning, that's how they decide. Oh, wait, they can't decide. That's how they choose what to do. So we spend how many hours trying to outthink an animal that can't think? Think about that, fellas. So, um, if you've got the best habitat, the best structure, the best cover, and a good food chain, you, you're the one that might be able to bring these fish out of their complacent behavior. So, what goes on now, as the water temperature starts to cool, that upper layer of water starts to approach the temperature of the water beneath it. When that happens, those two mix. That's called a turnover. So you may have a few days where you can smell a little bit of a musty smell coming off your pond. And the fish may be a little sluggish. They may not feed as well as they were. Well, or they may not bite as well as they did. Well, what's going on there is when those two layer of, layers of water mix during turnover, uh, that toxic, anoxic lower layer of water mixes with the vibrant, healthy water above it. Oxygen values drop. It's a little bit stressful for a few days until the atmosphere does its magic, bringing more oxygen into the water, and the water is cleansing itself. Then you start to see your fish behaving a lot differently. What happens then is they move shallow, and they begin to gorge themselves. I mean, they, the, the thing about large, I'm talking about largemouth bass. So as largemouth bass do what they do, uh, they know instinctively that the days are getting shorter, the nights are getting longer. There's a full moon over Tulsa. <laughs> I like that song. So what's going on is the fish have a tendency to begin to move shallow and feed heavily. And they just gorge themselves as much as they can. So from about now or two weeks from now in the south, uh, John Funk, yours is going on now. I can tell by your comment, yours is going on now. What goes on, what's happening is the fish are going to feed heavily because they're developing eggs now. If you fillet a 12 or 14 inch female bass, she's got eggs. Now a lot of guys are fascinated by that, but don't be because they're developing those eggs for next year. They're not going to spawn this fall because it takes a long time to develop those eggs for them to mature where they can spawn. So that's going on now. Plus they're trying to build up enough body fat in themselves that they don't metabolize their own flesh in the wintertime. So for the next 10 weeks, 12 weeks, you're going to see catch rates go up, fish are moving shallow, feeding, preparing themselves. And if you think about it, your food chain is at its peak right now because your fish, you know, your bluegill, red air sunfish, minnows, shad, whatever bait fish you've got, they have spawned like crazy. And now there's a big, the biggest mass of the year is what you have in your pond right now. And the bass are going to feed on them as heavily as they can and begin to deplete those numbers. Now, you're going to get one more bluegill spawn in the south of the Midwest. <coughs> and you'll have even more babies going in the fall. But their numbers overall are going to drop. That's a natural thing to happen because they're growing a lot. I'm going to scroll down there and see if there's some more questions. Any advice? Okay, Brandon says, uh, any advice for targeting largemouth in the northeast as the winter transition? back and forth from summer to fall. Yeah, figure out where they are. If you can figure out where they are, then hit them with some drop shots. Drop shot in the fall, especially during the transition period, is, is an excellent way to try to find some bass. They're probably gonna be sitting above the thermocline, maybe in it right now, but in the, uh, in the Northeast, you guys, your temperatures are starting to drop. So your fish are gonna be moving shallow, so you should be able to catch a bunch of fish right now. Let's see here. Dick Tybert, been going around the pond, bass everywhere. Okay, see, Dick, where you are, you know, the, 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 the bass, you're going to see more fish around the edges over the next six to eight weeks than you've seen all year except early in the spring. Zach asked uh, how much structure is needed for growing large bass. I'll tell you what you need. You need, um, if you've got 20 to 25% of a pond's bottom covered with a variety of structure, that's enough to help grow big bass. Now, it needs to be diverse. You need to have some dense structure for little bitty fish as well as some bigger structure for bigger fish. It needs to broach the uh, thermocline, but 
perimeter is more important than anything. If you've got more more structure cover around the perimeter. Scott Lindsay says, even though our temperatures have still been warm, my fishing speeder has seemed to slow down. Does the amount of daylight and shorter days affect activity? Yes, it does. As the as the daylight uh, as the daylight shortens, as the temperature falls, feeding activity should go up. You should see more fish coming to the feeders for more reasons than one. You know, a big reason is you have more fish. You know, but the better reason is that fish that eat fish food, their metabolism rates peak out at around seventy four to seventy eight degrees. Fahrenheit, they're going to be feeding more actively at that point. Mark Finn, the Zepsters in the house. Hi, Mark. Danny Tolliver, Frank James. Should we increase feeding now? I'm going to tell you, yes, you should if they eat it. Now, if you're feeding too much and they're not eating it, cut it back. Here's the it's kind of where common sense kicks into gear here. Feed the fish what they'll clean up within about, I don't know, five minutes. If they're cleaning it up in 30 seconds, feed more. Now there is a there is a top on that. I wouldn't feed more than about 10 pounds per acre per day. Now, of course, you go bankrupt doing that at $45 a bag. But don't let that 45 bucks a bag spook you away because that if you're feeding that feed, that's the most efficient feed with the best growth rates that you can get. You know, for a 45 pound bag of Aquamax MVP Purina's fish food, by the way. You're going to get um, a 50 pound bag is going to grow 35 or 40 pounds of fish. So you're going to be spending a, over a little over a dollar to grow a pound of bluegill. Where you're, if you were to buy those bluegill, you're going to spend 15 or 20 bucks a pound. So feeding is efficient, but don't overdo it because you don't want to tax your water. Let's see. Uh, Tory Rhodes says so. Having tilapia, threadfin shad, freshwater prawns this time of year really helps put on late. Fall. Yeah, that's right, Tori. So if you've got tilapia, you got thread fins and bluegill and freshwater prawns, that's a pretty interesting topic. I'm not going to talk about that today, but I may tackle it later. Uh, yeah, your, your largemouth bass from now until Thanksgiving are going to gain a significant amount of weight. Think about that. Because we're, we're really targeting females because they're the ones that get bigger. For those guys that want to grow the biggest largemouth bass on the planet, you're, you're target, targeting females that you want to preserve to give them the chance to get as big as they can. The majority of their weight comes from weight gain from about late August until the 1st of December. Now, some of that weight is eggs. Yes, it is, because that's why, you know, in January, February, those people chasing huge bass, that's when they're catching the biggest bass, because those females are egg-laden and weigh their heaviest. But they're going to gain... Now, now here's, what, here's where I wanted to go. In January, February, they're full of eggs. Then March, April, May, they spawn. They lose a lot of weight. Then they got to eat a lot to catch up with the weight they lost. So the most significant amount of weight they're going to gain that's flesh and eggs is occurring from now until about middle of December, especially in the south. And if you got freshwater prawns, more power to you. Jim Liner, water temperature in Pentlala, Alabama was 83 degrees. Yep, I believe it. Susie Nugent, hi Susie, good to see you. Victor Moberg, hey, I answered your question early on. You're going to have to back up and go watch this thing again because I tackled your question about dirt moving. I hit it, I did it. Hey, Facebook Live, man, that's what it's about. Brandon, any tips for an angler trying to locate the thermocline? Yeah, go buy a thermometer, tie it on a string, and drop it over the side of the boat. And what you'll do, when you have a thermocline, the water will be hot at the surface this time of year. The temperature will drop a little bit. When you hit the thermocline, it's going to drop probably 8 or 10 degrees. So just drop it down a foot, pull it up, look at it. Drop it down 2 feet, pull it up, look at it. Drop it down 3 feet, pull it up and look at it. Or if you've got a depth finder, you can use your depth finder. And almost always a depth finder will show you the temperature differentiation. You can see it. But if you'll buy just a cheap little old $5 thermometer, you can do that with that. Let's talk a little bit about the other topics. There's a hurricane bearing down on the Carolinas. And uh, I saw Jason Nepstead on here earlier. And then um, our other buddy there from, from Fayetteville. You know what? I don't know if you guys know. Um, oh, gosh. Come on. Help me out here. 
Well, here's where I'm going. is when you've got that much of a weather change coming, Marty Stone, good gosh, I had a little brain fart there. Marty Stone is a great friend of mine. He lives in Fayetteville. I'm going to ring him when we finish here and just kind of check in with him. But uh, when you've got, you know, a hurricane that's a, that's a, that's a number three headed that way with, temper, with a wind gust 120 miles an hour or sustained winds 120 miles an hour where the forecast is between 12 and 35 inches of rain, here's what's going to happen. Now, so I'm, I'm going to talk just briefly about floods. When there's a flood, now the flood like Hurricane Harvey in Houston, that doesn't count because nobody gets 48 inches of rain in 10 days. But here's what typically happens in a flood. And here's what's going to happen for most ponds and lakes in the Carolinas, Virginia, and as that hurricane moves and makes its hook back to the southwest. There's going to be a lot of ponds and lakes that flood. Now, when a pond or a lake overflows its spillway, and it doesn't overflow more than about a foot and a half or two feet deep, if the pond's designed right for a 500-year flood, it's going over the spillway at about a foot deep. If that's the case... The majority of your big fish are not going to leave, but you're going to lose some small fish. And that's the bad news. The good news is the remaining fish can make up for that loss in one spawn. Okay, now the more significant thing, one of the things I was asking Jason is if, uh, I don't, I, oh, oh yeah, I asked him about the water chemistry. pH was 7.2 in that lake there in the middle of uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Well, when that water comes in and dumps on top of that lake, it's not going to change the pH much. But I have seen floodwaters and rainfall at, at such volume that it can drastically change the pH of water. Now, if it, this, this thing may hit Richmond Mill Pond, which is near Lawrenburg, North Carolina. The pH of that lake is 5.3. If the pH of 5.3 jumps in one day to 7, then there's going to be fish that are distressed. But I can't imagine that happening on that particular lake. So a, a drastic change in pH is a big, big deal during a flood. Fish migrating, if the water uh, floods a lake and stays above flood stage for hours and hours and hours, you're going to lose a few fish, but you're going to gain some fish. Both of those are bad things because the fish you gain are not going to be the fish you want. They're going to be trash fish that live in the watershed, carp, gar, buffalo, um, even Asian carp in areas where the floods are where those things live. Thank goodness along the Atlantic seaboard, you guys don't have to mess with that. But all that freshwater flushing, like in Jason's Lake there, what I would expect to happen is you'll see a rise in the lake. It'll be that way for several days, then it will drop. As long as there's enough substantial habitat for the best fish to stay, they're not motivated to leave. They're not going to leave just because the water is rolling fast. They're only going to leave because they don't have any food or they don't have a, a, a good safe place in the habitat to hang around. So I wouldn't expect a massive migration or a massive exodus of, of significant sized fish from a pond or a lake that's being flooded unless the water sits on top of it. <clears throat> For example, Hurricane Harvey, you guys are going to love this. I did some math. Hurricane Harvey last year that hit Houston. The hurricane hit Corpus Christi, turned up the Texas Gulf Coast, and stalled on top of Houston. I read one estimate that said there was about 37 trillion gallons of water dumped on Harris County. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but here's the math for that. 37 trillion gallons of water is enough water to put six inches of water over the entire state of Texas. That's a lot. But let me put it into a different perspective. 37 trillion gallons of water is enough to give every citizen of the United States, not every family, every citizen of the United States of America, their 3,000 gallon per month minimum water bill for three years. Here's another perspective. 37 trillion gallons of water is enough to give 5,000 gallons to every living human on the planet today. That's a lot of water. 
So when that happens, water has a tendency to not be able to go anywhere. And of course, all that water came off the Gulf of Mexico. All this water from Hurricane Florence that you guys are going to do a dance with before long, like tomorrow night, is coming off the Atlantic Ocean. That's amazing because it's all fresh water coming from a salt water source. But when that water gets dumped on top of your ponds and lakes, it can't go anywhere. If you get 25 or 30 inches of rain, it's going to sit. And as it sits, and all the agony of being people being flooded and cars being, you know, inundated and lives being disrupted, you know, what what happens with the ponds is you may have six or eight feet of water sitting on top of a pond. In that case, fish are going to migrate. Now, what's really amazing is some of your best fish are going to stay right there, but you're still going to get other fish coming in without an invitation. So after it's all done, after the flood subsides, it's a wise idea to evaluate your fishery and see what you got left. Now, conversely, let's just jet over to the left coast and West Texas and the western slopes of Colorado and California where they're fighting fires now because of a drought. As a pond goes down with a drought, what's happening is the water is evaporating. As the water evaporates, it's leaving behind everything that's dissolved in it. So if half the water dissolves out of your pond, let's say you had 100 parts per million uh, calcium carbonate limestone, and half the water evaporates, the only thing that leaves is the water. So now if you had 100 parts per million calcium carbonate, now you got 200 parts per million. And you get that giant rainfall that comes in and dumps a whole bunch of water and fills your pond back up. It's going to dilute those minerals and metals that have been concentrating over the period of time over a slow process during the drought. So if there's an extended drought, three or four years, and the water evaporates, it's leaving metals. It's leaving minerals, sulfur, um, magnesium metals, iron, um, calcium, salts, you know, sodium chloride, magnesium chloride. Those things are being left behind. So one of the big impacts is that um, is that when you do get that rainfall, it dilutes those minerals and metals, changes the pH, and that can cause a fish kill. So one of the things I tell folks that are in a drought, like Justin Shank might be, if you had a pond on the left coast, is be monitoring your water chemistry and maybe amend your water as the drought goes on. Now, how does it affect the fishery? When you're in a drought, the fish get congregated as the pond level drops. <clears throat> you got a five acre pond that drops three feet and it's four acres, but you're gonna lose about half the volume of the water in the top three feet that drop down. So then what happens is you have all these fish concentrated and the big fish eat the little fish. So you're, you, I've seen some of the fastest growth rates of game fish during a drought because as those fish get confined, the big fish make a living off the little fish. And then when you finally get that rain from a tropical storm or a hurricane or whatever it is that fills the pond back up, then you see massive spawns, great successful spawns and more bait fish and new cover and new fresh habitat it's almost like having a brand new pond. So those are the those are the things that happen during a drought and during a flood. So let's see. I'm gonna scroll down here, look at some of these questions here. Jason, you mentioned Jason Nipstead, you mentioned in our conversation that a concentrating fish in a smaller area from lowering the lake could be a good thing. Yep. Well, uh, Jason, what I was talking about. So here's the conversation Jason and I had. Jason says we got a hurricane coming at us. Jason's Lake is, is a pretty nice lake, 130 acres or so, right there in uh, um, Fayetteville, uh, North Carolina. And the question was, can we, should we draw the lake down to prepare for the hurricane? My answer was yes, draw the lake down. If you can get it down two feet before the hurricane hits, that's a home run. The worst thing that happens is the hurricane steers away from you and you don't get any water. Well, that's still not a bad thing because that concentrates the fish and in that lake, the bass are crowded. And in the crowded bass lake, the big fish can take advantage of that by eating a bunch of the little bitty fish. But they didn't open the gate. They were a little bit worried there was a log stuck near the pipe and if they opened the gate, they were afraid they couldn't shut it, which is a legitimate problem. Okay, so there's that. Let's see here. Um, Mike Cottrell, okay, last question. Sure. <laughs> We had a ton of rain. Will you have a big fish lost due to water overflow, dumps into the creek, do they go deep into the pond 
Must say, so happy to have a full pond. Hey, Mike, your best fish don't leave. They tend to swim upstream. It's actually, and you can talk to any good bass angler, when there's some influx of water coming into a pond, the best place to go to have better catch rates is where the water's entering the pond. You know, ask Ty Cleave about that. Oh my gosh, when it rains around Houston, that guy's headed out to neighborhood ponds, and where the water's flowing in, he's catching double-digit bass because that's where they go. Their nature is not to leave. Now, grass carp, on the other hand, they do prefer to leave. They'd much rather leave than stay in one place. Where the largemouth bass, they don't. Bluegill, big bluegill, they don't. The fish that are going to migrate out of a lake are little bitty fish, which can be made up quickly from a spawn. Brian McGuire, is this time of the year worth putting bacteria in a 60-acre lake in Phoenix, Arizona? Just stacked bass, just stocked bass and bluegill. Let me make sure I haven't missed any questions before that one. Um, <clears throat> Brian says, is bacteria the same as fertilizer? Let me answer that one first. No, it's not. Hi, Chris Blood, Texas Hunter Feeders. You know what? I'm going to take a minute and tell you something here. I love Texas Hunter Feeders. That's our go-to feeder right there, Texas Hunter. They have the best feeders on the market. They have the best customer service. When we order a Texas Hunter feeder, they'll drop ship it straight to our client that day, as long as we get the call in before about noon. You know, and the feeders, outstanding feeders. Also, I want you know, I haven't said thank you to Purina Mills. Thank you to Purina because they help sponsor this show and make sure that we can come to you guys every week. You know, they help cover a little bit of the cost, so I appreciate that. Uh, Brian, bacteria is not the same as fertilizer. Bacteria is a living entity that um, microscopic little critters that decompose organic matter. That's the best way to put that. There's all kinds of bacteria, but bacteria tend to process organic waste in a pond. Like if you have algae, when the algae dies, bacteria process that. Now, to go back to your question, is this the time of year? Is this time of year worth putting bacteria in a 60 acre lake in Phoenix, Arizona? Just stocked with bass and bluegill. The I'm gonna come at you from this from this direction. You have a lot of bacteria in a pond. Now, if a pond is or a 60 acre lake is overwhelmed with decaying plants or plankton blooms or it's too green. Yeah, then consider putting some bacteria in to give it an advantage. Aquafix.com is a good place to go. They will analyze the water for you and help come up with some ideas. But if nature's doing its job, which it almost always does, as long as a lake is not overwhelmed with a reason to have bacteria, then you don't need it. But if you wind up with a big heavy plankton bloom or way too much algae or too much plant life that dies too quick, then adding bacteria could be a smart thing. Uh, I'd probably need to ask you a bunch of questions like, um, are you aerating? You know, are you feeding the fish? I'd, I'd need to ask you those questions before I could give you a better answer. But I'm going to tell you, most ponds have enough natural bacteria to process the natural waste that it has. Let's see here. Nikki Probst, thanks for being at the Purina Research Farm last week. I learned a lot. Got to put it to good use already. Hey, Nikki, that's great. Um, I think you sent an email to them. They forwarded to me, I think. Uh, last week, I was at the Purina Farm in St. Louis. And they had 90 dealers there out west of St. Louis. And we uh, uh, spent time trying to help those feed dealers learn about some opportunities locally about fish ponds. So I spent a little time on Google Earth looking around. And there's not very many places where there's a feed store in the United States within about 30 miles that there's a pond or a lake or a marsh or something that they can do something to help. Just kind of throw some stats out there for you. In these United States, there's somewhere between four and a half and six and a half million private lakes and ponds. Heck, here right here in Texas, there's 1.2 million private lakes and ponds. My little pond management company, Bob Lusk Outdoors, we take care of about 350 of those ponds. So more people taking care of their waters is a good thing. So I try to give some tips to some of those feed dealers on how to go find pond owners, sell them some fish food, help them with some pond management, send them to Pond Boss. If you've got friends with ponds, send them to PondBoss.com. Send them to Bob Lusk Outdoors. 
send them to this Facebook page. Our, here, here, here's our deal. Here's my driving passion. I am finishing my 39th year as a professional lake manager, fisheries biologist. My driving mission in life is to help people be better stewards of their land and water. Send them to me. Because we have a huge network of people that can help manage ponds and lakes. Now, do I want to make a living at it? Yeah, I do. I have to. I've got, I got to buy shoes for the grandkids. Heck, some of their parents can't afford it. i got to do it. But I like it. And you know what? One thing I never thought about when I was raising children, that those children were going to grow up and they were going to have children. I never, hey, listen, for you know, those of you who aren't grandparents yet, you're going to be going to a whole lot of birthday parties for little bitty people. I go to at least 10 a year. It's really fun. So, yeah, i got to get paid a little bit. Chris Blood says, great question about Brian about the thermocline. Does bass location in shallow or deeper waters make a difference in feeding and biting lures? Absolutely, yes, it does. You know, so uh, one of the things I was talking about on Keep Austin Fishing weekly weigh-in yesterday with Chico, Mike Garcia, <clears throat> they were talking about using stealth to chase down fish and catch bass during these tournaments and fishing events that they have. Uh, Ray Scott asked me a question one time that I always remember. He said, hey, Palm Boss, he said, do you think you should sneak up on fish in the summertime when it's hot, or should you roar in there with, them, with your engine going full bore? My answer to that is, is try stealth, and it ain't working. Remember what I said earlier in this broadcast, if the fish are not biting, but you can find them, they're not biting, they're complacent because they've already fed, you got to wake them up. Now, fish don't sleep, but they get complacent. And roaring in there with some noise with an engine. I mean, if you've ever been striper fishing with a guide, every good striper guide has got something he can bam, 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 hit the bottom of the boat with or turn his turn his music up and hit the bass or the bass is going boom, boom, boom. What that does is it takes lethargic fish and forces them to move. When they start to move, they're more likely to hit a lure. So there's my answer for that. Scott Lindsay says, I may have some more flood questions next week after the hurricane from here in South Carolina. Everybody be safe checking on your ponds during flooding. You know what, Scott? I've been through a hurricane. The hurricane itself is exhilarating. Now, one like Florence is scary. So if you folks are in the path of that hurricane, leave. There's, <laughs> there's a funny Facebook page. If you guys haven't seen it, you need to go find it and read it. You will laugh. It's called Effing, E-F-F-I-N-G, uh, SC South Carolina. Go to that. Go to that Facebook page, and they made a comment today. They posted that if you choose not to evacuate, please do the search dogs a favor. Go buy a package of wieners and put one in every pocket so they can find you first. <laughs> Even though that's kind of funny to read today, it won't be funny if that's you later. So I'm going to uh, put out a plea for those in the path of the hurricane, Jason. Scott, you guys, go somewhere else. You know, you might feel like a hero, but I'm going to tell you something. When, you, when you're in the path of a hurricane that's got 120 mile an hour winds, it's still blowing 80 miles an hour when it's 100 miles inland, it's knocking trees down, power lines down, you're going to lose power, you're going to lose water, you're not going to be able to navigate the roads, it's going to get hot, and it's not going to be convenient. So, get out while you can. And I'm not the governor of North Carolina, but I ought to be right now because you guys really need to make an exodus. So um, I think I pretty well handled all the questions here. And I'm going to wrap it up by saying this. If you haven't subscribed to Pond Boss Magazine yet, please do that. It's 35 bucks a year. I see Steve Lewis checking in here. Steve, you must have been out checking ponds tonight, buddy. But 35 bucks a year. I mean, that's less than a Friday night date with your favorite girlfriend. Uh, pray for the Carolinas. Yeah, Steve, that's exactly right. Pray for the Carolinas. You know, um, of course, I love Chris Blood because he's, he's always trying to get me to plug me, which I don't do a very good job of that. The uh, best way for somebody to get in touch with me to find a lake manager, well, here's the thing. Pond Boss, we've got a resource guide. It's, there's one online at pondboss.com. You can send an email to info at pondboss.com. If you need some help pond management-wise, the Pond Boss Magazine has got a, a huge network of really good people that want to help. We really do. And I'm telling you, we vet our advertisers, we vet our friends, and we've got some outstanding people. So info at pondboss.com. Now, if you're interested in me helping you, 
bobblusk at outlook.com is my email address. I check it every day. That don't mean I respond every day. Like yesterday, I spent eight and a half hours driving back from Nebraska. I'm not going to respond while I'm in the truck driving back, but I'll get to it when I can. Let's see here. Uh, Dan Nichols says, I bet you struggle every day carrying that head about. That head of what? I mean, you're looking above my neck. How do you know what kind of head I got, dude? So, I appreciate that comment. I'm going to leave it right there. Uh, we also have all kinds of books available out there. My cocktails just add water. Now, of course, I don't, I don't feel real guilty plugging what we do, even though a bunch of you DIY guys do. I don't care. We're in the business to make money, but I'm also in, in life to help you. So we've got all kinds of services. We've got all kinds of books, videos, magazines. Go to pondbox.com. So I've chewed up an hour, and I appreciate you guys tuning in. So, uh, hey, all you guys in the path of that hurricane, be safe, and I'll be checking in with you later. Send me more questions if you got them. Adios for tonight.